much for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to thank Dr. Chala and the organizing committee for this very great honor. I, I really find this a, a wonderful uh, symposium. So thank you very much. I'm going to be talking about diabetic cardiomyopathy and I'm calling it the perfect storm. Basically, if you look at cardiovascular disease, it is the most common cause of mortality in type 2 diabetes. And I just want to point out that while we all talk glibly about it affecting 70% of people with diabetes will die from a cardiovascular cause, I think it's very important to break that down and realize that number one, sudden death is very common in diabetes. In, by, in this uh, particular study, Saver Timmy 53, about 30%. More importantly, heart failure has twice the incidence that we uh, of acute MIs. And we always think of diabetes having acute MI. And in fact, it's clear that heart failure has a bigger preponderance in this population. When you look at, obviously this is not, this is very well known to you, incidence of any cardiovascular, death from cause, death, death from cardiovascular causes, hospitalization for cardiovascular causes, or death from coronary artery disease is always more common in people with diabetes, and in fact, probably hits about twice more, uh, two to three times more frequently. Okay. What I we don't know. always accept is that the incidence of CHF is also very common in diabetes. And what's most important is that it starts early and that in fact, it continues and it is relatable to age. And obviously, heart failure or CV death is more frequent, and I don't belabor that point. Hello. In the United, sir, in the UK, hello. Yeah. sir, sorry to interrupt, but your slides are not visible. Oh dear. Can someone help me? Yeah. Yes, sir. Someone's going to... So sorry about that. I am electronically sorry. handicapped. So I, ap I apologize <laughs> for my electronic <laughs> handicap. Uh, <laughs> basically, I'm going to be talking about diabetic cardiomyopathy. And just to make sure you understand, I am very, very honored to have been asked to give this. So thank you, Dr. Chala and the organizing committee. Uh, basically, all of you are very well aware 
that diabetes has a very high mortality and most of the mortality is by, uh, driven by cardiovascular disease. And as I said, in uh, Saver Timmy 53, if you look at the overall incidence of cardiovascular disease, there was a preponderance of sudden death, uh, but more importantly, this topic, heart failure was twice as common as acute heart attack. So when you talk about cardiovascular disease, in fact, only a small portion in quotes is from acute MI. Most of the others is manifestations of heart disease or alternatively what they do in terms of life. And of course, there's clear evidence that diabetes carries a higher risk of any form of cardiovascular disease. And I'm not going to belabor this point at this point. I do want to point this out very importantly, that in fact, cardiac congestive heart failure or heart failure is extremely common in diabetes. It is relatable to age. And everyone looks at the right hand where you see the older people getting a high amount of congestive heart failure. I want to point to the fact that it starts at a very early age. And it's very important to understand this because as I go forward, you'll understand why some of Dr. Hanif's talk is partly where I'm going to be also touching on. And obviously, hospitalization to heart failure or CV death is more common in diabetes. In the, United, uh, in the UK PDS, it was found that at a hemoglobin A1C of less than 6%, approximately 2.3 heart failure events occurred in 100 person years. When you looked at a hemoglobin A1C of 10%, it was 11.9 heart failure events, clearly a five times higher incidence related to glucose control. And this is the incidence of sudden cardiac death. Again, you see a twofold increase just because you have diabetes. Now, if you look at congestive heart failure individuals, what you find is a fascinating statistic. In studies of individuals with congestive heart failure, somewhere between 33 and 50% of people have what would be called pre-diabetes. So in effect, there is something about congestive heart failure and diabetic cardiomyopathy that actually occurs way before we can diagnose diabetes. And I cannot underscore and stress what Dr. Hanif said, that in fact, when we use the surrogate marker of glucose, we are already with the horses well out of the stable and we are trying to close the door on its rear end. And I think it's very important to understand that we have to start thinking about diabetes at an earlier time, mainly because the complications that cause the biggest degree of morbidity and mortality start before we even diagnose the disease. So the major components of the, for the pathophysiology of diabetic cardiomyopathy, it, the major driver is abnormal fatty acid accumulation and metabolism. And there are three specific sites that get involved in this process. The epicardial adipose tissue, intracellular triglyceride, this is cardiac steatosis, very akin to uh, hepatic steatosis, and coronary plaque accumulation. And we'll sort of go through this very quickly. So what is epicardial ep uh, uh, adipose tissue? It's an ectopic fat deposition located between the myocardium and the visceral pericardium. And there is no fascia separating this. It is almost exact, becomes almost one tissue. So there's a huge amount of crosstalk between what happens in the adipose tissue to what happens in the surrounding uh, tissues. Uh, it's mainly located in the atrioventricular, interventricular grooves surrounding the major branches of coronary arteries, atria, right ventricular free wall, and the apex of the left ventricle. So it actually forms a sort of an envelope of for most of the heart. And in the grooves, it accumulates more easily. The adipokines and cytokines, whether they're beneficial or non-beneficial, secreted by this tissue, may exert very significant paracrine effects on the cardiomyocytes, the fibroblasts, the coronary endothelial cells, and smooth muscle cells. So this tissue, by being there, already plays a role across the whole pathology or the whole histology of that area. So what is the 
What is the role of epicardial fat? Why should we have epicardial fat? First and foremost, it is an immediate energy tank for the heart. When in, in terms of stress, it can take a lot of energy from that area. It also is able to prevent cardiac lipotoxicity in the sense that it buffers some of the free fatty acids coming. It acts as a filter before the heart or the myocyte actually has to see the free fatty acids. Thermoregulation is very important in terms of protecting the heart, not only from the heat, but from the cold. After all, you have to keep the heart at a relatively stable temperature. Mechanical protection. The heart is constantly moving. The sheer forces on the arteries, on the veins is huge. Something has to cushion the sheer forces as the heart keeps moving. If you have a wonderful heart, you're going at 60 beats a minute, that's what you're gonna to have to protect against. And obviously coronary arteries require this protection from the pulse wave that they generate. And then there's an immunological support. This tissue has the ability to have modulate immune responses in the area. So what are we talking? What cells are we talking about? Well, adipocytes are not homogeneous. They're a heterogeneous group. In fact, epicardial tissue that is perfect is mainly made up of brown adipocytes, while imperfection is as it becomes white adipocytes. And this is an interchangeable uh, uh, cellular type. The one can migrate to the other, and I'll show you that. But when you look at white adipocytes, which are the most common adipocytes uh, that we see in human and adult life, they're located under the skin, around internal organs, in the central cavities of the bones. The main function is to store energy. Other functions is to insulate the body from extreme temperatures, cushion it, all the things I've already talked about. What about brown adipocytes? Well, brown adipocytes are mainly in, in the biggest abundance in fetal life and in infancy. And they're there specifically to protect the, uh, uh, the uh, baby or the fetus from therm uh, thermal stresses. So that is what they do, they generate heat and they also tend to insulate from heat. So in effect, they are very active from that point of view. However, when you look at the transitions, you see them some difference in histology. Brown adipocytes have a lot of mitochondria, small droplets of fat, uh, white adipocytes, mitochondria are gone. They've been pushed aside. They've become markedly less. And it's just a big white glob of fat. And as that expands, that's what we'll talk about. Beige adipocytes are a mixture between these two. And they're the transitional from white to brown. And then there's the pink adipocytes, which are mainly in mammary tissue and make milk. When you see the relationship, you find that Cold exposure will in increase your beige adipocytes. If you live in extreme temperatures like we do up here, most people will gain some weight in the fall and early winter. Why? Because they're protecting themselves against the potential cold temperatures. Now, we've obviously changed that around. You go from a heated house to a heated car, for God's sakes, even your your steering wheel is heated to a heated office. So we never actually expose ourselves to the temperature, but we are preparing for it. So now what happens is you get this beijing, and then now that we're collecting and we're not using this, it starts to go back to weight gain and we become white adipocytes. Weight loss will induce a much more browning because you need to protect the, from the, uh, the, protect from the elements from the heat and cold. And so there is a fluctuation in the histology at the, because of the functional changes that are induced. Now, let's talk about where fat goes wrong, either because of an increased amount of what we eat or because of something that uh, Dr. Hanif sort of mentioned, the fact that in India, we have people who are lean, who are insulin resistant, but also have lowered insulin capacity. If your insulin capacity functionally is low, then you cannot hold adipos adipocyte tissues, uh, free fatty acids in adipocyte stores. They're gonna increase the amount of free fatty acids coming out. So there is either free fatty acids from the diet or free fatty acids just because you're insulin resistant. The point is you've got a lot of free fatty acids in the circulation. They go to the liver, 
And in the liver, they're processed. In the process, extra free fatty acids get deposited in the liver, you got hepatic steatosis. Similarly, you get free fatty acids going into the heart. There, they're going to be collecting in epicardial tissue. When epicardial tissue cannot accommodate that, they now start going into myocytes, causing intracellular uh, steatosis, and that's your, the cardiac steatosis that you see. And then it, the inflammatory responses you'll be talking about starts to affect the coronary arteries. So how does fat deal with free fatty acids? Well, if you have a lot of pre-adipocytes, then all that happens is as you start putting more free fatty acids into the adipose tissue, your pre-adipocytes become adipocytes. That's a healthy hyperplasia, and you are going to find a relatively benign obesity. On the other hand, pre-adipocytes are limited. It turns out that we determine the amount of pre-adipocytes we'll have at a very early stage of uh, fetal, and inf fetal life and infancy, and we don't have the ability to have a lot of pre-adipocytes. To have pre-adipocytes in adulthood, we have to take them from other sites, like mostly from pre-osteocytes. Pre and so therefore, one of the reasons why with TZDs, you get osteoporosis, because TZDs tend to cause the pre-osteocytes pre pre to be able to become pre-adipocytes and store free fatty acids. So it's clear that we don't have a lot of pre-adipocytes. Now, you, the only option the adipocyte has is to become hypertrophic. Once it becomes hypertrophic, you've got three issues. Now, the hypertrophy now makes the vascular, uh, makes the area insufficient in terms of vascular because pre while pre-adipocytes are associated with new vessel formation, hypertrophy is not associated with increased vascular supply. So now you've got a store of fat that is already swollen and now it's not getting enough of a blood. Once you start to get that, this is going to cause hypoxia within the adipocyte. This stimulates recruitment of immune cells, establishes an inflammatory response and fibrotic response. And this fibrotic further restricts the adipose tissue, so causing a further vicious cycle to, 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 to entail. And so in effect, you've now got an expansion of a fat store because of the ectopic amount of fat that's being stored. Once any fat, anywhere, if you restrict it, it becomes inflamed, it becomes hypoxic. That's the reason why if you have to gain weight, it's better to gain weight in your hips. There is no restriction. Your hips can go for miles, and therefore it is always going to be a relatively benign obesity. Once you put it into the tummy, there is restriction. Now you've got uh, the inability of this fat to continue to function. It becomes hypoxic and becomes inflammatory. And so I think that's the difference between apple obesity and gynecoid obesity or pear obesity. So I've talked about the normal effects of uh, epicardial fat. What are the pathological roles in the right side of the slide? Well, now you've got most of the inflam uh, most of the cytokines that are beneficial start to become decreased in number, and the inflammatory, the pro-inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines are going to start to increase, and that's what drives the tissue to become a hot bed for inflammation and the subsequent uh, issues that we see. If you look at the location, and I told you there was no fascia, the perivascular fat that is inflamed is going to affect the vasovasorum, which is going to affect the myocardium, and most importantly, the endocardium, uh, sorry, the, my, the, the, the uh, ed, um, me, media of the, uh, of the vessel and the internal of the vessel. So now you've got an inflamed interior uh, 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 of the vessel, and now you've got a perfect setup to be able to have atherosclerosis develop in an accelerated fashion. So a perivascular fat that became inflamed suddenly made the vessel that it was trying to buttress and to protect into a hot mess. If you look at specifically fat in the atrial grooves, that fat in the atrial grooves, because of its ability to cause inflammation is why there is such a high incidence of atrial fibrillation in these individuals. 
it's important to understand that the myocyte will pick up fat on a substrate basis. The more substrate, the more free fatty acids there are, the more free fatty acids it will pick up. When it picks up free fatty acids, it has two outlets. One, it oxidizes the free fatty acids to use for energy. The heart uses free fatty acids as a major fuel source, but it also tends to cause a certain amount of storage. So it's about a 25 to 75% split. But as the amount of free fatty acids going in increases, that 25%, even though it's only 25%, starts to cause a significant intracellular accumulation of triglyceride. Free fatty acids coalesce to form triglyceride. And so now you've got high levels of intracellular, intramyocellular triglyceride, cardiac steatosis. So epicardial fat spilling over into the myocyte has now caused the myocyte to become abnormal and become quite significantly dysfunctional. And we already told you that, in fact, you are going to get an, an extension into the vessel. In a study that was done where they, where they did endometrial, endocardial biopsies and related the endocardial biopsies to the glucose state, just as Dr. Hanif pointed out, the disease starts before the surrogate marker is clearly abnormal. So here you see that obesity and impaired glucose tolerance already caused a significant amount of myocyte triglyceride and diabetes, which has further enhanced it. And what's most important on the right side is as those cells become filled with fat, you start to start to notice that there is a decrease in filling rate. You're starting to set up diastolic and systolic dysfunction. And in fact, if you were to look at the triglyceride content of the heart and look at its stages of dysfunction, you very quickly find that diastolic dysfunction with normal EF, when there's low amounts of fat, and by the time it becomes of very high levels of intermyocellular fat, you've got overt ischemia and infarct and heart failure. Now, what about the internal or in, interior of the vessel? We know that insulin resistance, high free fatty acids will drive insulin resistance, and that changes how the lipid profile. So increased free fatty acids in the liver, you package the liver into a large number of VLDL. VLDL comes out of the liver. It is going to be processed by the action of lipoprotein lipase to IDL and LDL. Lipoprotein lipase is insulin permissive in the face of insulin resistance. It doesn't work. So you get an accumulation of VLDL. That's why you see the high triglycerides. VLDL under the action of uh, CTEP uh, basically uh, exchanges HDL cholesterol. So your HDL cholesterol starts to decrease in size. And most importantly, the nascent uh, apo, apo lipoprotein of HDL because it's no longer got fat in it, it will be excreted. So you get the typical low HDL. So the typical atherogenic potential is high uh, triglycerides, low HDL, and a small dense LDL. That has tremendous ability to go through the endoth endothelium in the artery. It will accumulate in the endothelial lining, and then it will uh, recruit monocytes, make them into macrophages, make them into scavengers because that's how you scavenge it. And therefore you get foam cells and now you've got the development of plaque. The more perivascular fat that you've got, the more diffuse the, uh, the uh, atherosclerotic uh, drive is. And that's why we see such a diffuse athero atherosclerosis in people with diabetes. Notice again at the bottom of the slide. Dr. We've Adi, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, please uh, finish up, uh, finish up oh, uh, quickly. And we sorry, are I was going yeah, yeah. sorry, I will finish. So notice pre-diabetes, then diabetes. So clearly pre-diabetes is a very high risk situation. In treatment, you want to talk about exercise. Exercise works all the time. And in fact, a meta-analysis showed that overall, and, and then certainly endurance exercise clearly drops the uh, epicardial fat. Statins clearly drop ep epicardial fat. A study done uh, in uh, patients comparing atoro versus pravastatin, sorry, uh, you saw that the atorvastatin uh, was able to drop epicardial fat. 
P PCSK9, even though they are not an anti-inflammatory, lowering LDL also has uh, uh, ability to lower uh, epicardial fat thickness. Metformin has been shown consistently to be associated with lower incidence of uh, congestive heart failure, and it protects against epicardial fat. Sensitizers, the pure glutazone, I think all of, all of you know about. DPP-4s have been shown in small studies. These are all small studies because you, it takes time and uh, the ability to measure epicardial fat, but it has been shown to decrease epicardial fat. And GLP-1 agonists have been clearly shown to do this. This is liraglutide after 12 weeks. Uh, uh, Dulaglutide and semaglutide does the same thing. And so, in effect, SGLT2 uh, inhibitors have really focused in why a diabetologist is just to know anything about the heart. And so that's and where they played the biggest role. And today, SGLT2 inhibitors form a central role in the treatment of diabetic uh, congestive heart failure or non-diabetic congestive heart failure because of this ability to look at sugar and free fatty acids in a different way. So I think I'm going to rush to this to indicate that SGLT2 has also decreased the volume of things. And we, you all know the effects on heart failure and hospitalization on CV death with, associated with, uh, uh, with um, heart failure. I just, or with, with SGLT2 inhibitors, I just want to point something out. We have to think about the mineralocorticoid. I told you there's fibrosis, there's aldosterone. Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, therefore, have to come in to stop the fibrosis. So, in conclusion, Diabetic cardiomyopathy is an abnormal storage and excess free fatty acids. It causes and magnifies insulin resistance. It causes in, uh, adipocyte hypertrophy induces hypoxia, oxidative stress, which then affects the tissues around it. Similar to hepatic steatosis, it is initiated well before we make the diagnosis of diabetes. So what I'm asking you, and this is just out in the middle of nowhere, maybe we should be thinking of making the diagnosis of diabetes at a lower range, 100 milligrams per deciliter, or hemoglobin A1C of six, or consider prediabetes as a clinical entity that requires therapy and not for us to say, you just try life and exercise and you're at risk for diabetes. I think it's very important to think early. Remember these two quotes from these Chinese people. The best time to plant an oak tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And that's what we're doing. We're not planting the tree 20 years ago when the whole thing starts. We're trying to fix it now. And please remember, superior doctors prevent disease. Mediocre doctors treat the disease before it is evident. And inferior doctors treat the full-blown disease. We don't want to be inferior doctors. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I went over. No.